Well, good morning, church family. I'm excited to see you today, and I don't know about you, but I'm excited for the Christmas season. Our church is decorated, and I just wanted to give a big shout out to the Whitmers for decorating our church. They came and volunteered their time and spent many hours doing this. I saw Chris walking around trying to make sure every single light works. Uh, he had this little gun that could check it. So anyway, it was it's great, and thank you for, for doing that. Um, I also wanted to... Um, by way of announcement, point out for you that this morning our angel tree is still in the fellowship hall, and Miss Nancy Kincaid let me know that there are eight angels that still have not been picked up, that still need to be accounted for, and so if you are planning to be a part of that ministry or you would like to be a part of it, uh, you can either talk to Miss Nancy Kincaid to find out more, or this morning you can go over to the fellowship hall and, uh, and take a look at our angel tree there. A couple more announcements for us. Um, this evening there will be youth group uh, from 5 until 7. We will have our fun and games time and eating time from 5 until 6. And then from 6 o'clock we will join here, which is also another announcement. We'll be having our Vesper service this evening starting at 6 p.m. And so our youth will be a part of that as well uh, this evening. We'll also have a congregational meeting next Sunday, December the 6th, and a stewardship banquet. Um, And uh, we have our normal Wednesday night catered supper, December 2nd. I believe that is all the announcements I have for us. So let's turn our attention now to the call to worship and to the worship of God this morning. The call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 47, verse 6, and it says this, Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. Let's pray together. Father God, this morning we want to do just that. We want to sing praises because You are a King. God, because You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And God, because You are worthy of all of our praises. But Father, I... No, if there are any in here that are like myself, oftentimes I come into this service on a Sunday and my mind's distracted. I'm distracted by things I have going on at work or things that are coming up in my day or in my week. And Lord, I just pray that you in this moment would be high and lifted up, God, that you'd remove all distractions, God, from this worship service so that we can concentrate our hearts and attentions upon you this morning, Jesus. We pray it in your name. Amen. We now stand together to sing our hymn of praise, O Come All Ye Faithful.
beautiful singing, by the way. Uh, This morning, our affirmation of faith comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. It is a responsive reading, so we'll respond together as a church. It says this, Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. You may be seated. The virgin shall bear a son, and you shall call his name. God is with us. God condescended for us because he did what only he can do, and he came to make a way for sinners. Every single man, woman, and child in this room today is just that. We are sinners in need of God's grace in our lives. And so we have the next uh, silent confession of sin as a time to, to do just that, to repent before the Lord. So let's take the next 30 or so seconds to do that. Amen. Hear these words of pardon, this assurance of pardon from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 21. It says this, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Amen. Ask uh, Larry and Jan Connor to make their way to the front of the sanctuary. Uh, This year we've been blessed to receive some new members into our church family. Uh, Larry and Jan are the last two from that previous uh, membership class. So it's you started great and you're finishing great, right? We, 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 I, I got mixed up on which Sunday we were going to have you do that. So you're learning. I'm not a perfect pastor. I'm not a perfect person. So, uh, but Jesus is, right? And so that's, that's the most important thing that we point you to Jesus. But Larry and Jan Connor are, are a, a delightful couple. Uh, the more you get to know them, the more you're going to love them. And they are the proud parents of, of Nathan Connor back there, right? That tall drink of water that, that Mary is married to. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we... <laughs> We are glad to have you as a part of our church family. And I want to encourage those that are here this morning that maybe you're not a member of the Bartow ARP Church. As you listen to uh, Larry and Jan respond to these membership questions, I want you to, to consider whether or not you could say yes to all of these questions. Because, Lord willing, at the beginning of the new year, we will have another membership class. And perhaps you would like to attend that class to see if you would like to officially make Bartow ARP Church your church home as Larry and Jan are doing formally today. You're really already a part of our church family, but this is a ceremony to uh, reflect what's already a reality in your lives and in all of our hearts. So Larry and Jan, do you confess you're a sinner in the sight of God, that you deserve His punishment, and that you are unable to save yourself, and that you are without hope of salvation except for God's love and mercy? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners? And do you receive and trust in Him alone for your salvation? Do you accept the Bible comprised of the Old and New Testaments as the written Word of God and that is the only perfect rule of faith and how to live? Do you promise to trust in the guidance and strength of the Holy Spirit so that you can live all of life as a Christian following the example set by Jesus Christ? Do you promise to exercise faithful stewardship of God's resources entrusted to you for the furtherance of God's kingdom and purposes? 
Do you accept that the doctrines and principles of the standards of the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church are founded upon the Scriptures? In loving obedience, do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of this church, promising to seek the peace, purity, and prosperity of this congregation so long as you are a member of it? Okay, wonderful. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you, Lord, for the work your Holy Spirit did in Larry and Jan's life so many years ago. You regenerated their hearts. You brought them from spiritual death to spiritual life. And in that moment, they were justified in your eyes. As a holy, just God, you declared them innocent of all charges, not because of what they've done, but because of what your Son did on their behalf. He took their sin debt upon himself, and he paid the full price of it. He paid the death penalty for their sins. And I thank you, Father, that they now stand in your presence and in your eyes, innocent of all charges. Because when you look at them, you don't see them in their sin, but you see them clothed in the righteousness of your Son and their Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in their life even now, sanctifying them, polishing out all the, the warts and the, uh, the, the, the blemishes in their lives because of the sin that remains. Help them to be confident of this, that you who began a good work in them will bring it to completion. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to meet me on the front porch of the, the church after the service so that uh, the church can extend the right hand of fellowship or the right elbow or the right fist, but whatever we're doing these days. Okay, thank you. God bless. As we turn our hearts towards a time of prayer this morning, I have several uh, needs related to our congregation I want to make you aware of uh, this day. Uh, two, two of our deacons in our church experienced a loss of a loved one this past week. Uh, young Justin Smith, J.D. Smith, uh, lost his grandfather uh, this, this past week. Uh, because of COVID, uh, they don't have a, a memorial service planned at this moment. Um, his grandmother prefers to wait for a, a bit, uh, but we'll try to keep you informed about when that memorial service will be. Uh, please let uh, J.D. know that you love him, that you're thinking of him, and you're praying for him. Also, um, Mr. Matt Warner uh, lost his, his mother uh, this past week, Miss Joyce Warner. She went home to be with the Lord. Uh, that service is going to be this Saturday at the Hope Lutheran Church in Plant City, uh, at 2 p.m. If you want any further details about that service, you can either see me or Matt following the service. Matt is here with us this morning. But, but let Matt know that you love him, that you're thinking of him, that you're praying for him. Uh, Miss Gay Ford fell this week and, and fractured her arm. So let's be in prayer for her that the Lord helps her heal uh, quickly. You know, she's one tough cookie and, and she's all about Jesus. So we, we love Miss Gay, uh, but we are, we're sad for her that she's experiencing that pain and that frustration right now. Uh, continue to keep Miss Betty Jo Wilson in your prayers. Uh, Miss Betty Jo had two uh, clots in her uh, in in her lungs. Uh, they believe that they, are, they have dissolved. She'd had a, a touch of a spell of, of pneumonia, uh, but I spoke with, uh, Claude spoke with me this morning. She's hoping to come home tomorrow, so that is certainly a praise God, but continue to pray for Miss Betty Jo, uh, please. Uh, as we know, uh, we're heading into Advent, the Christmas season, and so let's remember our, our loved ones, our missionaries that are away from us at this time, and certainly uh, those that protect and defend our freedom that we enjoy in this, in this great nation. Now let's continue to remember those that will be touched by uh, the Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes that we have, we have distributed, when we've uh, assembled and, and distributed, and now let's pray, be in prayer for the families that will be uh, touched by the Angel Tree Ministry here as well. So let's go before the Lord in prayer.
Sovereign God, we take joy in knowing that you are sovereign over the entire universe. You are worthy of sincere worship this morning. You long for us to worship you in spirit and in truth. You deserve complete, perfect obedience to your word and your ways. We know that if we did not gather this morning to sing praises to your name, that you would you would have the rocks cry out and sing praises to you. We've come here this morning to bend our knees in submission to you. We've come here this morning to submit our hearts humbly to you. We've gathered here to admit that we are grateful for your reign and your kingship, your lordship. We read in your word how powerful you are, that you have told the winds to be hushed, to be still, and to cease from blowing. You've healed the lepers. You've changed the mind and the hearts of kings. You've caused the dead to come back to life. And the most miraculous gift of all, you've caused those who are spiritually dead. To come to life. We ask this morning that by the power of your word and your spirit. That you would draw your elect to you this morning. That you would nourish your elect this morning. We bring our church family and her needs before you this morning, O God. And we ask that those who are sick might be healed. That those who are unemployed would be granted a means of employment. That those who are employed might be able to show themselves faithful to their master and would be granted advancement and promotion. But most importantly, Lord, I pray that all of us would find our contentment in you. We pray for our church in this Advent season as we live In between your first coming and your second coming, may we look backwards, remembering who you are so that we can have peace and assurance that when you come again, we will be welcomed into your presence. Lord, I'm mindful of the homeless here in Bartow this morning. Meet their needs. For those that are lonely, may relationships and family relationships to be reconciled and restored this year. For those who are hungry, may they be granted food, and if by any means possible, may they be granted means of employment, Lord, we pray. We pray for our nation, Lord. We pray for unity. Not because of philosophy or ideology, but we pray for unity because of your Holy Spirit blowing and revival. That we might see the severity of our sin and see the need for Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people agreed saying, Amen. Begin the Advent season. And as our, as, as our tradition here at Bartow ARP Church, we light the Advent candles. And so as my wife and kids come forward to, to light this candle, I just wanted to remind you uh, what is Advent. So what is Advent? I looked up the definition this morning, and it says this. It's a hopeful, expectant, and joyful arrival of a notable guest. That's what an Advent is. It's the joyful and expectant, notable arrival of a guest. You know, my kids are great examples of this as Christmas is coming up because my kids, they see the presents building and they get excited and more excited every single day. As Christians, the Advent season reminds us in the same way that their excitement reminds us of our enjoyment and hope that should be building at this coming King. 
So this morning we light the prophecy candle. The prophecy candle reminds us of this, that God is a man of His Word. That God has made promises. And that those promises, that He would be our God, that we would be His people, are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus fulfilled those They were fulfilled and they are being fulfilled by His Spirit even now in us and they will ultimately be fulfilled at the second coming. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I'm so excited about this Advent season. And God, I pray that You would grow that excitement not only in my heart but in the hearts of our church, God, as we look forward to the coming again of our Lord and King, to the one whom our hearts long for. God, you have promised, you have prophesied, and we know this to be true. So God, we wait expectantly today, in this day, God, and we wait for the coming of our King. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let them sing. the Gospel of Luke as we begin our Advent series. Uh, For the next several weeks, we're going to be in some passages of Scripture that I'm sure are familiar to you, but I trust that we will come to them with wonder, love, and praise, as J.C. Ryle says. Uh, This morning, we're in Luke chapter 1. We're going to read verses 26 through 38 for our passage of Scripture of this morning. Uh, Hear the reading of God's Word. If you don't have a Bible, uh, the passage of Scripture should be printed in your bulletin uh, this morning. If you don't have a bulletin, you can uh, see one of the ushers at the back and they'll get you a copy of the bulletin. Hear God's word this morning. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. 
of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How? How will this be? Since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let us pray. Glory be to you, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come in this service this morning that we might see these words in a fresh way this morning. That our faith would be fed, our souls would be transformed by the truth contained here today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look at this picture. At first sight, you might think, wow, that's a beautiful waterfall. But upon further glance, you would look and say, "Uh uh-oh, is that waterfall crashing down upon these unassuming people? What you have here is a picture that was taken several years ago by a famous photographer near my hometown. His name was Mel Grubb. Mel Grubb was known for his aerial photography. And what he captured one morning when he was in his plane was East River Mountain. With the fog rolling off East River Mountain, looking like a waterfall. If you grew up in southern West Virginia, you would see this photograph in many offices. Some people contain this photograph in their home. And so I'm familiar with this picture. But I have to confess something to you. Every time I see it, I admire it. Every time I see it, it puts a smile on my face because I'm amazed that in that specific moment in history, Mel Grubb was able to capture a picture for posterity. A spectacular moment in history that maybe could be repeated again, but may not ever happen again. Why do I share this picture with you this morning for this reason? Over the next several weeks, you're going to have an opportunity to take a look at a picture in the Scriptures. It's a picture that is familiar to you because it recounts the coming of Jesus Christ. It is a picture that I'm sure is very familiar to you. But I hope and pray you still admire it as much today 
as you ever have. Because the picture contained in Scripture that we're going to be taking a look at today and in the next several weeks was a specific moment in history that was spectacular. What J.C. Ryle refers to as the most marvelous event in the history of the world. It was the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It was the birth of Jesus Christ. And as we come to this familiar picture in Scripture, what I hope and pray is that you come to it with pure joy and amazement. Because what's contained here is extraordinary, but essential. Essential to our faith. This picture here, you're familiar with it, but friends, it contains some foundational truths to your faith and your eternity. It has a picture here of Jesus, and if what is revealed here about Jesus is not true, then there's no hope for you. If what's revealed here about Jesus is not true, then there's no hope for the world. We all die and we spend eternity separated from God. So friends, what I want us to do this morning is come to this passage of Scripture with a heart like Mary's. Humble. Ready to receive and accept who Jesus is contained here. So this morning, the way I want us to investigate this passage together is I want us to explore several foundational truths contained here. These truths are foundational to our faith, just like the foundation of this building is essential to the structure. A foundation is important to a structure of a building because it is that upon which everything else will be built. And if it's not strong enough the rest of the building will crumble and fall. What this passage reveals to us about Jesus Christ is foundational to our faith. And if what's true here is not true here, then the rest of our faith crumbles. You say, but Tanner, I'm familiar with this passage. I've been a Christian for a decade, for two decades, for three decades, for four decades. Well, just like the foundation of this church building, That foundation is just as essential today as it was years ago. And friends, what's contained here about Jesus is just as essential today to your faith as it will be on the last day that you breathe your last breath. So friends, what does this passage reveal to us about Jesus? The first foundational truth it reveals to us is this, is that we must accept Jesus is God. We must accept Jesus is God. Look at what the passage says in verse 31 and 32. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary in the town of Nazareth. Nazareth was a little small kind of podunk town about 70 miles northeast of Jerusalem. And if you remember, in, the, in Luke's gospel, about six months earlier, Gabriel had, a, had visited Zacharias to let him know that his wife, although she was old and considered barren, would be giving birth to a son that would later be known as John the Baptist. And now six months later, the same angel Gabriel appears to this young teenage girl that scholars say was probably around 12 or 14 years of age. And he greets her and he lets her know that God has a plan for her life. That she's going to conceive and bear a son that's going to be known as the Son of God. Look at what he says in verses 31 through 32. And Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And that name means Yahweh is salvation. And he will be great and be called Son of the Most High. Son of the Most High. Most High is a, is a Hebrew term that referred to the Most High God. So already the angel is letting her know that that will be conceived in her womb will be the Son of God. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David. But then look down at verse 35, lest there be any confusion. And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore the child to be born will be called Holy The Son of God. 
Now you can accept this passage and this truth, or you can reject this truth. But it will not change the clarity of the truth that's revealed here. The Holy Spirit is clear in the, the reading and the containing of this passage that Jesus is God. A foundational truth to our faith, a foundational truth to our salvation, that Jesus is the second person of the one and only true triune God. That throughout all eternity, one God has existed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And what happens here in this passage is the enunciation of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That God, the second person of the Trinity, is going to take on flesh from this point forward in eternity. And that's left some Christians spooked throughout the centuries. They've tried to wrestle with how Jesus could be both fully God and fully man. And it's caused some to try to wrestle with that to the point that they've fumbled the truth. They've mishandled the truth and have fallen into heresy. Docetism said that they denied Jesus' humanity... To the point that they said that Jesus didn't really suffer and die. So they were trying to protect Jesus' divinity, that Jesus is God. But they fell into a heresy as they denied his humanity. Another form of heresy came in the form of Arianism. Where they denied Jesus' divinity. They claimed that Jesus was the first of God the Father's creation. And they mishandled the truth as well. And so they did not build their faith upon the foundational truth revealed here. That Jesus is both fully God and fully man. United in the person of Jesus Christ forever. Why is that important? There are a lot of reasons we'll highlight this one reason. In order for you to be saved by Jesus Christ, Jesus has to be able to represent you. And it was important that God the Son would take on flesh. That he could represent the humanity he came to redeem. And so the scriptures are very clear here about the foundational truth revealed here. That Jesus is the unique God-man. He's fully God, he's fully man, united in Jesus of Nazareth. I remember in ninth grade, I had to begin reading some Greek mythology. And I remember having been a Christian for about 10 years at that point, I remember being shocked by what I read there. I remember reading about Zeus and his sexual escapades and how his love relationship and seduction of Alcamina became the, the source of the birth of Heracles, which you probably know as Hercules, the superhuman. I remember taking the, the Greek mythology book to my mother and saying, Mom, is it okay for me to be reading this? And she was like, What are you reading? I showed her the book, and she's like, where did you get that? I was like, it's school? She's like, oh, you're reading it for, for your literature class? Yes, ma'am. And she said, well, it's okay to read it. But I remember, even as about a 14, 15-year-old young, young man, comparing and contrasting the Greek mythology with the theology of Luke chapter 1. And seeing that there was really no comparison, but there was a stark contrast between the two. If you study Greek mythology, what you see in the birth of Hercules is this, that it looks like Zeus is like this comic book superhero that has a love life that's been merged with like the daily soap operas that my mom used to watch. 
And so what you see in Greek mythology is nothing all that fascinating or spectacular at all. In fact, it looks like a high-powered business tycoon with immorals seducing women to be with him. You contrast that with what's revealed here in Scripture. You see, one of the many reasons why the Christian faith is so spectacular and special that we have here no hanky panky. <laughs> but what we have here is something very spectacular that the Virgin Mary conceives the Son of God, how? By the Holy Spirit coming upon her. And you say to yourself, that's impossible. It would be for me and it would be for you. But friends, as verse 37 reveals, nothing is impossible with God. And the reason why this truth is so precious to us is that we have also the same promise given to us that was given to Mary. The Lord is with you. Jesus was prophesied to come as Isaiah 7 prophesied earlier in the service, that he is Emmanuel, he is God with us. God has bridged the gap of separation between us and him, and he did it through his Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's powerful because God is so holy and we are so sinful. Which brings us to the second foundational truth to our faith that's revealed here in God's word this morning. It's a truth about Jesus. Not only is Jesus God, and we must accept that, we must accept the fact Jesus is holy. Jesus is holy. That's the second foundational truth we must accept. If Jesus is going to save us from our sins, if Jesus is capable of saving us from our sins, not only must we accept that Jesus is God, we must accept that Jesus is holy. Well, how do we have proof of Jesus' holiness? We have proof of his purity Look in verse 27. The angel Gabriel comes to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph to the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. The Greek there is explicitly clear that Mary is one who's had no sexual relations whatsoever in her life. And then we see in verse 34 not a question of disbelief from Mary She understands exactly what the angel has told her, that she's going to conceive a child, not by Joseph, but by the Holy Spirit. It's going to be called Jesus, which its name will mean Yahweh is salvation. He's going to be the Son of God, and He's going to be holy. So the question that she asked angel Gabriel in verse 34 is not a question of disbelief, but a genuine question. Biology. How? How will this be since I am a virgin? In the Greek it says, since I have never known a man, is what it says. I have no knowledge of a man in that way. And what we have in verse 35 is something that's poetry and modesty revealed to us. It says here in verse 35, The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Notice the modesty and the purity here in the telling of how Virgin Mary is going to conceive baby Jesus. It says the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. The same word there in the Greek is the same Greek word that's used in the Septuagint in Exodus chapter 40. Do you remember what happens in Exodus chapter 40? The last part of the the book of Exodus reveals to us the architectural structure of the tabernacle. If you you try to read the Bible through in a year, you're going to get... Genesis pretty well. You're going to get to most of Exodus you'll enjoy, but when you get to the the structure of the tabernacle, you're probably going to tap out in your reading. If that doesn't get you, you'll definitely tap out when you get to the book of Leviticus, probably. But in Exodus chapter 40, here's what happens. After the tabernacle has been built, it says that a cloud 
overshadows the tabernacle. What's that shadow? It's the Shekinah glory cloud of God the Father. So what is Gabriel telling Mary? Yahweh is going to come over you. Not in an immoral way, but with his sovereign power, you will conceive baby Jesus while remaining a virgin. It will be miraculous. Why is that significant to Jesus' purity? Because had Jesus been born of Mary and Joseph, Jesus would have inherited Adam's sin nature called original sin. So you need to know, friends, that Christmas is not just a sentimental time for the Christian. Christmas is an essential time for the Christian. If Christmas is not true, then we all die and go to hell. That's how foundational this truth is to the Christian faith. We need Jesus to be born of the Virgin Mary so that he does not inherit Adam's sin nature. So that out of the gate, Jesus comes untainted by sin. Why is that significant? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But not just any kind of blood can be shed. It has to be a substitute that is spotless, that is perfect. And if Jesus had come out of the gate in the manger, tainted by original sin, then we're damned from the start. But what we have here, is a foundational truth to our faith that Jesus is holy. He's pure. Why? The first reason is he was born of the Virgin Mary. I read an article this week that was an interview with Ozzy Osbourne. He's known as the Prince of Darkness, uh, affectionately by those that love his music. As far as I know, Ozzy Osbourne's not a believer. In fact, uh, in this interview, it asked him if he'd ever been to church, and he didn't share whether or not he had ever been to church, but he said that he had tried to read the Bible on a few occasions, but couldn't understand the language. I wonder if he'd only read the King James Version of the Bible. He didn't say. But later in the article, he said this. Someone asked him if he'd ever been to church, and he said this. If I had gone to church, I'd still be there confessing my sins. I thought that was pretty powerful. For a man that's been celebrated because of his immoral lifestyle and his rejection of anything holy, I thought it was pretty profound that he would admit in that article that he was so sinful and he committed so many heinous acts in his life, had had so many sinful thoughts that he would still be there today confessing his sins. What I wish I had the opportunity to share with Ozzy Osbourne this morning is the truth I'll share with you. That because Jesus is holy, you don't have to spend the rest of your life in church sitting here confessing your sins. But rather, Jesus has come as your spotless substitute, and he's taken your place. And he's paid the death penalty that you owe God for your sins and your transgressions. That's why the Apostle Paul says, For our sake, God the Father made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the good news of the gospel, my friends. And the scriptures assure us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That if we believe in our hearts that Jesus died on the cross and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
Do you see why Jesus' holiness and purity is so foundational to your faith? Do you see why it's so foundational to your salvation? Because Jesus comes to take your place. And so what matters is that you put your faith and your trust in Him rather than upon yourself. So that you can be justified in God's eyes, declared innocent of all charges, declared righteous in His sight, and He promises He'll continue to polish out all of the sinful bumps and bruises and blemishes in your life. And if you say that's impossible... Friends, the word assures you here in verse 37. Nothing is impossible with this God. All he requires of you is that you come and bend your knee before him in submission. Which leads us to the third foundational truth we'll take a look at this morning in our passage of Scripture. Not only does it reveal to us that Jesus is God and that Jesus is holy, it reveals to us the fact that Jesus is King. Jesus is king. Look at verses 31 through 33. Gabriel says to Mary, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Now notice in verse 32 and 33 what highlights the importance of Jesus as king. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. That's important because... We know that the Messiah was promised to come through the Davidic line, through Davidic heritage. And so what Gabriel is telling Mary here is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the promised Messiah. He's the promised Messianic King. He will, come, he will give to him the throne of his father David in verse 33, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In other words, this Messianic King in Jesus will reign over all the twelve tribes of Israel. And notice something about his kingdom in verse 33. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Now being a good little Jewish girl raised in a nice Jewish synagogue, although she was a teenager and maybe she couldn't read, this Annunciation and proclamation from angel Gabriel would have hearkened in Mary's mind a very famous prophecy in 2 Samuel chapter 7. She would have heard it read over and over again in the synagogue. You remember the scene of 2 Samuel chapter 7. King David is sitting in his, his castle and he looks out and he sees the tabernacle and he says to himself in his mind, how can I sit here in this palace When God, the Most High God, is living in a tent in the tabernacle. And so David decides in his mind that he's going to go and build God a temple. But do you remember the the exchange between God and David? What happens is this. That God comes to David and says, no, you're not going to build me a temple. Your son Solomon will do so. And there's a play on words here in the original Hebrew. God looks at David and says this, you're not going to build me a house that's a temple. But rather, I'm going to give you a house, a dynasty, that will last forever. Because your kingdom, David, will have no end. How can that be? David is dead and gone. Israel at times has not been able to inhabit the promised land. How can this be that King David's throne would last forever? It was a messianic prophecy about Jesus as the Messiah. That Jesus comes as the King of Kings, and with his kingdom, there will be no end. Look to him. There's another reason why Mel Grubb is special to my heart. Jennifer and I got married. One of the wedding gifts we received on our wedding day was that someone in her family paid for Mel Grubb to take our wedding pictures. So it was very sweet that this famous photographer in our hometown would be taking our wedding pictures. We got married in Jennifer's home church, and I was serving there as the 
associate pastor at the time, and I'll never forget at the reception as we stood under the, the gazebo that her grandmother had made for us as they were cutting the wedding cake. Uh, we felt like famous people that day. There were so, much, so many cameras flashing. It felt like paparazzi. And I'll never forget one of the first words Jennifer said to me after we were married. She said, there are so many cameras, I don't know where to look. And what she said to me after the, the, the reception, she said that was probably the best piece of advice and definitely the first piece of good advice she gave me as my husband. She said, when you looked at me and you said, stare at Grubb's camera, we're paying him to take the pictures. <laughs> okay. But what we said that day is we're paying him so he's the one in charge. Friends, in your life, there are going to be a lot of people that come into your life that are going to clamor for your time and your attention and for your resources. But they're not in charge. Why? Because they're not the king. Friends, look to Jesus. He's the king of kings. In a time and a season in our nation's history where some of us are excited and some of us are depressed, let us remember that there's a king who has a kingdom that there will be no end, and that is King Jesus. And friends, as you go towards the Christmas holiday season with loved ones and friends that don't know Jesus the way you know Jesus, remember that King Jesus is sovereign over their salvation. That the same Jesus that could call the dead to rise again can call those who are spiritually dead to come to life as well. So you look at this passage, you might say, Jesus, the king of all kings, impossible. No, my friends, it's not. As verse 37 says, nothing is impossible with God. And so... This Advent season, as we take a look at Luke's gospel, may you lay your head in rest upon God's omnipotence. Let God's omnipotence be the pillow of rest and comfort in your life. Because with him, nothing is impossible. How do you know? You see it in Jesus. The Son of God who's perfectly pure and who's your king. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege and opportunity to dig to sink our teeth into the truth of your word. Help us to rest our feet of faith upon the firm foundation of who Jesus is. Both this day and every day here to come. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people agreed saying, Amen. Let us stand in response to the truth about who Jesus is as we sing him together. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
Three words that make all the difference in the world. God with us. You know, the, the holidays can be a lonely time for many people. Let it not be a lonely time for you because you have this assurance in Jesus that God is with you in Christ. And the same Holy Spirit that came upon Mary with that power, miraculous power, is the same Holy Spirit that regenerated your heart and now lives inside of you this day. Leave here knowing you don't go alone. But Jesus goes with you. Receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both today and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.